This is an introduction to optical coherence tomography, where we measure the reflectivity of a tissue specimen as a function of depth. It's based on the idea of a Michelson interferometer, which I want to briefly, briefly start by introducing. You've got a source with some sort of spectrum. We'll explore some various options in this tutorial. And the source is directed off of a beam splitter. Some of the light goes to a reference mirror, which is movable up and down in this diagram. And some of the light continues on towards a region where we have some sort of specimen. I've drawn two dashed lines up here to indicate locations where the mirror surface is an equal path from the beam splitter as a location in the sample. And then the light recombines, coming back from the mirror and from the sample region, and the beams recombine, and some of that light goes to a detector where we make a measurement. The question we have here is somewhere in this region, we've got a scatterer of some sort. I'm just going to mark it like that, almost like it's another mirror. And I'm going to call this a scattering object. And this object reflects the field with a coefficient a. So I'm going to write field reflection coefficient has the value of little a. And we're going to call this scattering object itself capital A. So we're going to attempt by moving this mirror to figure out where that reflective object is as a simple initial problem. So the question boils down to how far away is A? Okay, so this is an interference problem, as you can see. And we will write a preliminary expression for the interference that occurs at the detector. Now you should know that the total signal I sub D at the detector, that equals the amount of reflected light, we'll call it the intensity arriving at the detector as a function of the reflection off the mirror, so I sub M, plus the amount of signal that we would get if we only got the reflection off of the scattering object with a field reflection coefficient A. And we will call that a squared, the intensity will go as the field reflection squared. And it will be A squared as much as there was reflecting off of the mirror, which had complete reflection. And then there's going to be an interference term, which I'm going to write as 2AIM. And then I'm not going to write anything formal over here. I'm just going to say this is a function of the mirror position. And this last term here, of course, is the interference signal. So our job is to figure out some way to take this information, isolate the interference signal, and figure out where the reflector is. And our approach is simply going to be to scan the mirror. Sounds simple enough. Let's consider various ideas for how we could scan the mirror and what kind of data we would get. Well, the variable we haven't talked about yet is what kind of spectrum do we have in our source? So the first idea we could have would be a monochromatic source. This might be something you would have studied about in any physics or optics class where you were taught about interference. If we look at the spectrum of a monochromatic source, that would be the as a function of the optical frequency nu, which is related to what we typically call omega, just instead of the angular frequency, this is the cycles per second frequency. So the electric field as a function of nu, we will just have some value nu naught, and all of the electric field strength is at that location. So I just draw a red delta function there. So what kind of interference signal will I see? Well, the interference signal could be positive or negative, depending upon whether there's constructive or destructive interference. And so I'll draw an amplitude envelope up here on the top and on the bottom, representing the maximum constructive interference, const, 
or destructive interference, DESTR. So again, we're isolating just this part of the signal. Of course, you can't have a negative total signal, but the interference can be constructive or destructive. And if I mark this axis here horizontally to be the time difference, tau, between the movable mirror and where the scattering object A actually is, when that time difference is zero, when the path lengths are exactly matched, which they're not in this diagram, I will get a reflectance maximum. I will have my interference term be fully constructive interference. And that sounds great. You might think, great, I just put my mirror there and I will get a bright signal there and I will know that that's where object A was but not so fast. You probably know that as we sweep this mirror around, or when the time difference is one cycle in time, one period in time rather, of the light source, this monochromatic light source, I will get other maxima. And it's actually, the, the, period, the pattern is going to look like this, obviously within the limits of my poor drawing ability. So that's actually what we're going to get as our interference signal. There are going to be lots of mirror positions, lots of time differences where we get an equivalent signal. The envelope stays constant, and there's no way to know which one of these corresponds to where the mirror actually is. So we cannot locate where that mirror is if we just have a monochromatic source. What's this signal look like? It this interference signal goes as 2aim times the cosine of the optical frequency 2 pi nu naught times the time difference tau. So we do have a maximum when this argument of cosine is zero, but we also have many other maxima where whenever nu naught times tau is an integer, so that it's an integer number of 2 pi. All right, the next idea we're going to have is to use a two wavelength source. And in this case, our spectrum is going to look similar. We're going to send in two wavelengths. I'll space them out equally around this original frequency, nu naught. And so we're still going to have nu naught where it was before, but now we have the concept of the spacing delta nu between the two frequencies. What's that going to look like? I'm not going to work out the math of this here, but we're going to get two sinusoids like this at two different frequencies. So we're going to get a beep pattern for wavelength one and wavelength two, or frequency one and frequency two. So if I plot out again here versus tau, I'm still going to get a maximum of reflection constructive interference when the time difference is zero because when the path lengths exactly match any wavelength will have a maximum in its constructive interference pattern but then i will have a beat envelope because i'm going to have two different dependencies of time difference as a function of wavelength and that's going to look like this There's going to be an envelope that has this sort of shape. And then the electric field oscillates within it. So this looks similar to what we had before. The functional form of this turns out to be the same maximum amplitude as it was before. You still have the cosine of 2 pi nu naught times tau as we did before, but then we also have a cosine envelope that multiplies it here. That's the new thing, this envelope, and it's the cosine of 2 pi delta nu over 2 times tau. I'm not deriving that beat envelope here.
here now. But you can see it happening. And one thing that's important here is that this width, the width of the beats here, I'm sort of drawing the full width at half max here, that width, when you look at the math of how it depends upon this envelope term, the width scales as one over the spread in the frequencies. So this is a little bit better. We have reduced some of the ambiguity. We no longer could mistake this maximum for this maximum, but we still have a recurrence effect. We still don't know where the mirror is actually located. We still have a smaller number of equivalent locations where we might think that the mirror is, we can't tell them apart. Both of these spectra that we've talked about here are mathematical abstractions where you have an infinitesimally narrow spectral width for each of these frequencies shown here. In the real world, this problem goes away because we will have some amount of continuousness, a broadbandness to the source spectrum. And we're going to model for the moment the idea of a broadband Gaussian source. So a Gaussian source is one that has a shape that looks like this. It has some sort of full width at half max, which we're going to characterize by a delta nu. And it still has a center frequency, which we'll call nu naught. When we plot this out, we no longer have a beat frequency that goes off to infinity. Eventually, the interference of the light with itself at a delayed time, as path length differs here, is going to no longer have any constructive or destructive interference at large values of tau. So what we're going to get when we do this, we will still have a maximum at the special value of zero here. For the same reason, every single wavelength in this spectrum is going to have a constructive interference maximum when the path lengths between the two mirrors are exactly the same. So the difference is zero. But the envelope ends up now looking like this. So all you get is a single, what we call a burst pattern like this, and it tapers off to zero at all other detunings. And all the same parallels from the previous one, however, hold. That's why I showed you the middle example. This width here goes as one over the bandwidth. So the broader the bandwidth of the source, the narrower the response function as you, as you sweep the mirror. And this function, I'll just write out conceptually, is very similar to what we have on the previous line. It's 2a i m, same sort of cosine term describing the red oscillations. But then I will just say we have a Gaussian envelope. And it's not important for this tutorial to talk about the mathematics of what the Gaussian envelope actually looks like. You can see it sketched out here. The broader the bandwidth again, the sharper the response, and the more precisely you know exactly where that scattering object is. So you can see now that with this sweep of the mirror, we get an, a response at our detector which clearly locates the particular location where the mirror actually is. And final takeaway here is that if we have multiple reflecting surfaces, in other words, if our scattering object here is not simply a mirror, but is a layered tissue with many interfaces, each one of which will generate a significant reflection, or even a continuous distribution of scatterers that will have different amounts of reflectivity, I'll imagine a layered tissue with three major reflections coming off of it. We might then have an envelope that looks like this. Small blip up here. We'll retain this big blip up here. And then we'll have a tiny blip down there. All of them have, so a medium, a large, and a small. And then our response of the detector will look like this. 
All three of these will have the same approximate width, but they have different heights. So we have that each one of these path length matches gives you position. And then the envelope amplitude gives you what I'd call the scatter strength. In other words, how strongly does each interface reflect relative to the other interfaces? And that's the basic idea of optics co optical coherence tomography when you sweep a mirror. You get a response versus mirror detuning, which gives you a interference burst every time there's a significant amount of scattering at that corresponding to that mirror depth into the t tissue sample. And you sweep out a nice reflectivity profile like this, and that gives you the information which can give you scattering versus depth. And as we can talk about in class, if you get scattering as a function of depth and you move around where you're interrogating the tissue, you can get a two-dimensional or three-dimensional image of scattering as a function of depth in a tissue.